All right. Um, so, so begins lecture 19, which is on some surface theorems. Uh, well, O'Neill calls them uh, global theorems for surfaces. Is section 6.3, and um, so I'm going to share with you the, the theorems in O'Neill here, of course, and. Uh, I will prove some of them, but not all of them, so this will be a relatively short lecture as they go. Um, what we're looking at here, though, are, are, are interesting theorems. They're, they're, they're roughly analogous to those theorems we saw before about curves of a specific type, right? If we had, for example, remember, if we had the torsion was zero, what do we, we would get to say? We, we could say that the curve was planar, right? Um, if the torsion was zero and the curvature was constant, it was part of a circle, right? Um, we had a few other theorems like that for curves um, where we were able to characterize the curve in, in terms of particular facts and figures about the torsion and curvature. Here we'll be able to say some similar things based on properties of say the shape operator and the Gaussian curvature. So it's uh, exciting uh, to see these theorems sort of find the um, analogous uh, part of that's our, our, our story here for surfaces. Anyway, so here's the first one, theorem 3.1. If the shape operator is zero on the surface, then the surface is part of a plane. Um, so, as is usually the case for most of these theorems, we invent some function, show its uh, derivative is zero, and consequently, since m is, oh, we're assuming m is connected, and since the function has a derivative, derivative zero, on a connected surface, it follows that the uh, follows that the function's constant, and the function being constant gives us what we want. That's kind of the general um, construction that's used in a lot of these proofs. Anyway, more to the point. So if the shape operator is zero. That means the covariant derivative of e3 in the v direction zero um, at each point, and for all vectors at at each point, right? So then the derivative um, of e3 is equal to zero along along all curves. Would which goes to show you that the E3 is a constant vector field on M. So we can use it and define this function. Uh, suppose you have alpha of 0 is P and alpha of 1 is Q, right? Um, and, and Q can pretty much be any, I mean, you can pick, uh, you know, any pair of points. You can find some curve like this if you want, right? Um, then given that pair of points uh, with this curve that goes between it, such that alpha of 0 is P and alpha of 1 is Q, um, we can define f of t as f of t minus p dot e3, right? And then, of course, df dt <coughs> gives me alpha prime of t dot e3 because p is constant, right? But alpha prime um, is a tangent vector, and uh, e3 is, well, it's normal. It's, this is part of an adapted frame, right? Um, it should be understood. Um, and since that's true for each t, that means that df dt is equal to zero for all t, However, um, so f is constant, right? However, f of 0 is 0, which means that f of t is 0 for all t. In particular, f of 1 is equal to 0, but that shows that q minus p dot e3 is equal to 0, which shows you that um, the, dis the uh, displacement between points in the surface, right, um, is perpendicular to e3, which means that the surface is a plane or part of a plane, all right? So the existence, by the way, of a planar point um, does not suffice to say that M is planar near P. Remember, we had some weird examples before, like the cubic one. It was like Z times Z is equal to X times X minus the square root of 3 times Y, parentheses times X plus the square root of 3 times Y, something like that. It had these six different region, hills and valleys, all kinds of crazy stuff going on close to the, the point where it's planar. But if you have that the shape operator is zero, you know, on some, on, on M, then that, that's enough, all right? All right, moving along, moving along here. Theorem, uh, excuse me, lemma 3.2, I've lost my cover paper. Uh, where did my cover paper go? Otherwise I get distracted, all right. If M is an all umbilic surface in R3, then M has constant Gaussian curvature. All right, so, oh, and with uh, non-negative Gaussian curvature. So if we have an adapted frame field, E1, E2, E3, um, 
and m is all umbilic, all right, then that means that the principal curvature um, is constant, which then means, of course, that E1, E2, E3 is a principal frame field, right, because E1 and E2 both have to be pointing in principal directions because everything's a principal direction. And in also, K1 and K2 are equal, and there you can equal to K, right? So, and by the last lecture, we had these, these awesome formulas in terms of E1 acting on K1, being the difference of K1 and K2, omega 1, 2. Remember, uh, we derived these at the end of the last lecture for a principal frame, all right? But um, the fact that K1 is equal to K2 makes this zero, makes that zero which means that E1, K2 is 0, and E2, K1 is 0, but they're both K, right? So we have both components, um, both possible uh, changes in K are 0, which goes to show you that, in fact, K is constant. Uh, so DK is equal to 0. But on the other hand, the Gaussian curvature is K1, K2, which is uh, script K squared, right? Um, Oh, by the way, that there shows that the Gaussian curvature is non-negative. It, it, um, we haven't shown it's constant yet, but we're, we're awful close because it's the square of something that's constant, <laughs> so it's constant. Um, or if you like, dk, d big k is 2k dk. My lights are flickering. Hmm. Hence, the Gaussian curvature is constant as m is connected. All right. So that's lovely. Um, Another the theorem that follows from this lemma that I will not prove, but I will state, if M, a subset of R3, is all umbilic with positive Gaussian curvature, then M is part of a sphere with radius 1 over the square root of the Gaussian curvature. Very nice, very nice. So this is sort of uh, analogous to, again, that, uh, you know, if you have, uh, you know, a planar curve, if you have something with torsion zero and, and constant curvature, then it's part of a circle with radius one over one over the one over the curvature. Alright, so that's uh, proved on page 275 and 276 of O'Neill, and it's based on some clever con curve construction paired with the lemma above. The corollary um, is the following. All uh, compact, a compact all umbilic surface um, is an entire sphere. Uh, so I can I can go through the proof of that with you here. All umbilic means that the Gaussian curvature is constant, right? And um, and and it's also it's remember oh that's out of frame, but we had that the constant was greater than or equal to zero, right? So either k is equal to zero, or the constant is positive. All right. If it was all umbilic and the Gaussian curvature was zero, that it pretty obviously shows you. I mean, you can I, I invite you to prove this. It's not hard. Just think about it for a little bit, you'll get it. The shape operator has to be 0 on m if you have this, right? But if the shape operator is 0 on m, then m is part of a plane, all right? But parts of planes are not compact, all right? Um, so let's see here. Therefore, m has a uh, Gaussian curvature positive and is part of a sphere but that means M has to be the whole sphere as M is compact. All right. Our next theorem is the following. On every compact surface, there is a point at which the Gaussian curvature K is positive. All right. The proof is on page 277 to 278 of O'Neill. Somewhat involved, all right. An application of this theorem, though, is nice. Uh, there are no compact surfaces in, ah, is, uh, is that a mosquito? No, it's just a moth. Go away. Shoot, shoot. Get, get, get. <sighs> we open the garage door later and let bugs in. Ah, get out of here. Scattle. <sighs> Sorry, I'm distracted a little bit here. <sighs> All right, there are no compact surfaces in R3 with... Uh, Gaussian curvature uh, non-positive, right? There has to be some point where the Gaussian curvature is positive if it's a compact surface, all right? Hilbert gave us this lemma. 
which again is pretty involved, This the proof of this. Uh, if M is a point of the surface big M, such that K1 has a local max at M, K2 has a local min at M, K1 is greater than K2 of M, then the Gaussian curvature is less than or equal to zero. This is on page 279 at 280 of O'Neill. It's got lots of nice ideas in the proof. All right, I probably should do it, but I'm being lazy. I hope you can forgive me. Um, I promise the next lecture will be more detailed. <laughs> uh, so problem, theorem 3.7 by Liebman. If M is a compact surface in R3 with constant Gaussian curvature K, then M is part of a sphere of radius one over the square root of K. Here's a sketch of the proof. All right, so if, if the Gaussian curvature is positive by theorem 3. Point, well, excuse me, the Gaussian curvature is positive by theorem 3.5. All right, in other words, that it's um, a compact surface, right, with constant Gaussian curvature. So if it's, if it's positive at one point, it's positive at all points. <coughs> excuse me. Let me drink my tea. Okay. You can argue then... Um, K1 and K2 are continuous, right? With K1 greater than or equal to K2 um, greater than or equal to zero. Um, let's see here. But um, as M is compact, that means that K1 has a max at some point, right? Because you have a continuous function from a compact domain and it attains its extrema. Um, important theorem of analysis. But, on the other hand, the Gaussian curvature is the product of the principal curvatures, K1 and K2. So if, if K1 takes a max, that means K2 has to take a min, if you think about it. Right? But then, all of a sudden, we fit the bill. We fit the bill up here for, for Hilbert's. We got K1 a max, K2 a min. So, goodness gracious, if we have K1 greater than K2, that means that the Gaussian curvature is forced to be non-positive. And yet, the Gaussian curvature is positive, right? So we can't have k1 greater than k2, therefore k1 has to be equal to k2 at p, but um, this then implies m is all umbilic, right? Because the principal curvatures are equal at p, and then so the sphere, it's all umbilic, which means then it's a sphere of radius 1 over root k. So that's a pretty, pretty neat result, as, as O'Neill points out to us. We, if we drop the um, stipulation of compact, which, again, if you forgot, for R3 just means that it's closed and bounded. Um, or if you want to get all fancy, every open cover admits a finite subcover. Um, uh, you know, if we drop the compact condition, though, that there are there are examples of constant uh, Gaussian curvature uh, things which are not spheres, but. Um, uh, in any event, that is section 6.3 of O'Neill in a nutshell. Again, all of the wonderful proofs are in the book. I invite you to read them, and we will go on from here. Thank you.